Here we stand on the precipice of All Hallows Eve, and look over our shoulder to the past. It was two years ago that our doors groaned open to admit the hungry, the sullen, and the intrepid. And since that fateful night, our numbers have only swelled into the cavalcade you see before you. A happy Halloween to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Carnival of Samhain on this most auspicious evening. Tonight marks Midnight Marinera's second anniversary, and the Carnies have just been dying to celebrate it with you. I may be a relative newcomer in your eyes, or years, as the case may be, but my ties to Midnight Marinera are deep and strong, and I have prepared a special attraction for the occasion. Right this way, folks. Everyone loves a good ghost story now and then, and tonight's featured sideshow is a particularly infamous one. Supposedly taken from the post-humorous writing of one Diedrich Knickerbocker, this story has since become legend in the United States. And, seeing as it's Halloween, we have the spirit of Mr. Knickerbocker himself to recount the tale to you. The legend of Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, at that broad expansion of the river denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators the Tappan Zee, there lies a small market town or rural port which by some is called Greensburg, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Terrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country, from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. From the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Hendrik Hudson. Certain it is, the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The old neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country, and the nightmare with her whole ninefold seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambles. In this by-place of nature there abode, in a remote period of American history, a worthy white of the name of Ichabon Crane. And I should express again, my dear Van Ripper, how much I appreciate the ride. I had very well expected to walk the rest of the way from Terrytown to the Hollow without the greatest sense of where I was going. That's no trouble at all. Just happened to be in town when you wandered in. Figure I ought to give the man what's gonna school my children a ride the rest of the way. Say, how far did you come to get here? Oh, yes. I'm from Connecticut originally, so it was not a terrible journey. Nothing short of what I anticipated, at least. It'll be good to get settled, though. 
Have a moment to relax and take in this charming valley before I begin giving lessons. Well, I could take you straight to the schoolhouse if you want. It's close enough to my route home. Not sure how suitable the place is for living. <laughs> Sir, I am nothing if not a man capable of compromise. I'm certain I'll find a way to manage. All of my worldly goods are here in this bag, and I have all the rest of the evening to get the place in order. It should suffice at least for a night, and then I'll see the other lodging if that fails. Huh. Well, honestly, it looks a mite crude to me, but I'll let you be the judge of that. I myself wouldn't want to be there all by myself once the sun goes down. Oh, tush. I'm not concerned. I'm certain the schoolhouse, rudely constructed as you claim, is more than fortified against any man or beast. I know a trick or two to securing the place to intruders. Oh, it's not the wild animals or thieves I'd be worried about. It's the headless horsemen. The what? <laughs> Come nightfall, you can bet there's a whole band of ghosts lurking around certain fields and streets. But the headless horseman, I he's the real chief of the spirits in Sleepy Hollow. Story goes, he's the ghost of a Hessian trooper who had his head carried off by a cannonball during the Revolutionary War. Since his headless body was buried in the cemetery down the road, his ghost rises each night and rides out on a phantom steed to seek his missing head. Oh, my. Oh, he goes galloping along in the dark, and many folks have said to feel him pass them with a blast of midnight wind as he hurries from the churchyard and back before morning. <clears throat> well, uh... That is quite a frightful apparition you describe, Van Ripper. It does remind me of some of the queer tales that come from my own Connecticut, in fact. I actually happen to have on me Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft, and would be happy to share some... Oh, well, we're here. Oh. Um, yes, excellent. <laughs> I see the schoolhouse is certainly... there. A bit more of a log cabin than I would have hoped, but... You are welcome to stay on my farm for a spell, if you're willing to lend a hand to some of the work. I am much obliged. As I said, I'll not keep you from your farm and family much longer. I'll pass the night at the schoolhouse. Fair enough, Mr. Crane. Fair enough. Please, call me Ichabod. Thank you again for the ride. Oh, you're welcome, Ichabod. Take care and keep an ear out. You never know when the horsemen might come galloping near. <laughs> Get up! Fare you well, Van Ripper. Yes. Yes, indeed. Nothing to worry about. Merely a superstition, I'm sure. I mean, Cotton Mather would never lie about witches, but these simple country folk must be taken by all manner of wild fancies. Best not to put much merit in them. Then again, perhaps it would not have been so bad to take Van Ripper up on his offer. The cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. He was tall but exceedingly length, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices conning over their lessons might be heard in a drowsy summer's day like the hum of a beehive. Interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master and the tone of menace or command or by the appalling sound of the birch as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Ouch! Truth to say, he was a conscientious man and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane scholars certainly were not spoiled. 
I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joined the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity. Trust me, my boy, you will remember this and thank me for it to the longest day you live. When school hours were over, he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys, and on holiday afternoons would convey some of the smaller ones home who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers, noted for the comforts of their cupboard. Indeed, it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils. The revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread for he was a huge feeder and, though lank, had the dilating powers of an anaconda. Mm -mm. That was absolutely superb! Mind if I take seconds? In addition to his other vocations, he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in psalmody. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers, where, in his own mind, he completely carried away the palm from the parson. Thus, by diverse little makeshifts in that ingenious way which is commonly denominated by hook and by crook, the worthy pedagogue got on tolerably enough and was thought, by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork, to have a wonderfully easy life of it. Good afternoon, ladies. <laughs> the schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood, being considered a kind of idle, gentleman-like personage of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains. Our man of letters, therefore, was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. How he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on Sundays, gathering grapes for them from the wild vines that overran the surrounding trees, reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones, or sauntering with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill pond, while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying his superior elegance and address. It ain't fitting all right, I tell you. Hmm. Not a whole lot we can do about it. I mean... Just look at him strutting around with them like a rooster. What has he got that we don't? He can read. Ah, shut up, Bonds. Ichabod was, in fact, an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary, and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. No tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow. It was often his delight after his school was dismissed in the afternoon to pass long winter evenings with the old Dutch wives as they sat spinning by the fire, with a row of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth and listened to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses, and particularly of the headless horseman. Night by night, road by road, the horseman rides out looking for that forgotten battlefield where he lost his head. He may never find it. And even then, who's to say if the Hessian's head is even still there? Well, it must be difficult to seek one's own head, goblin or not. Indeed. That's why some say the horseman will eventually tire of his quest, though he cannot rest until he has a head on his shoulders. It may not have to be his own. Oh, you don't mean... <laughs> All I am saying is watch yourself the next time you walk the roads at night. If you hear the beat of hooves behind you and feel a chill wind rush past, be thankful the horseman only passed you by. Otherwise, a wise man will pull up his collar and pray that the spirit has not given up his mission for his own head. Um, well, that is quite the horrid turn for our infamous headless horseman. However, have I ever told you, ladies, about the black magics and secret rites that took place in my home state of Connecticut? Yes, it was not so long ago that witchcraft... But if there was a pleasure in all this, it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards. What fearful shapes and shadows beset his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night? With what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window? How often he was appalled by some shrub covered with snow which, like a sheeted specter, beset his very path. 
How often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet, and dread to look over his shoulder lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him. And how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees in the idea that it was the galloping Hessian on one of his nightly scourings. Ah, ah. Oh, just the wind. <clears throat> All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness. And though he had seen many specters in his time and been more than once beset by Satan in diverse shapes in his lonely perambulations, daylight put an end to all these evils. And he would have passed a pleasant life of it in spite of the devil and all of his works, if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghost, goblin, and the whole race of witches put together. A woman. Very good, everyone. Very good. I think that will conclude our lesson for the evening. I'll see you all next week. Oh, Katrina! Katrina, a moment of your time, please. Yes, Mr. Crane. Did I do something wrong? Oh, heavens no. Quite the contrary, my dear. I wanted to compliment you on your singing voice. I tried not to play favorites, of course, but... I have always observed you have a natural talent for a song. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm honored. Oh, the honor is all mine. And furthermore, I believe that talent of yours can be further honed through more personal instruction. If you are willing, I should be happy to find the time to offer private lessons. Hmm. I would have to ask my father, but I believe he would also think it a good thing. And would you? I do. And we'll take you up on your offer, if I am able. Thank you. You're most welcome. Forgive me for keeping you. I'm certain you must be off. It's no trouble, Mr. Crane. I'll speak to my father on the ride home. Good night. Good night, Katrina. Take care. Until we meet again. Evening, Ichabod. You look cheery. Van Ripper, my good man, I am thoroughly smitten. <laughs> so the town ladies' man has finally settled on one, eh? Who's the lucky girl? That would be Miss Katrina Van Tassel. You can't be serious. Why not? She's the most lovely young woman I have ever met. Ha! <laughs> so too think half the boys in Sleepy Hollow, and they don't stand a chance. Listen, Ichabod, she's quite a catch and she knows it. Her father is one of the richest farmers in the county, and she's set to inherit it all someday. She's a coquette if I ever saw one, always teasing and leading on. Ah, uh, you'll have no end of rivals. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. Come now, Van Ripper. I am more than capable of dealing with these young ruffians. Besides, Katrina and her father have invited me to visit their farm tomorrow, and it is safe to say that many a man has not even gotten that far. Well, I suppose not. Speaking of, I was wondering if you would be so kind as to give me a ride there. <sighs> Now, over here is where we keep the bulk of the livestock. It's been a particularly good year for our souls. Their litters have been large and healthy. It is a good thing to see, Minheer Van Tassel. I am deeply impressed with the scope of your barn. Yes, so we've just added a bit to it, too. Make room for more pens. It's looking to be a grand harvest this year. Your farm does seem a place of impressive abundance. Your fields are rich and beautiful to behold, and your orchard practically bursting with ripe fruit for the picking. Surely this place is an Eden in itself. <laughs> oh, you make it sound so poetic. Now, son, you don't have to try so hard to humor an old man, but I am touched by the sentiment. Oh, nonsense, sir. I mean every word I say. It is truly a thing to be proud of. Well, thank you kindly. It's what keeps me satisfied, and that's what matters. Patience, Mr. Crane. Patience and virtue got me where I am today, and I don't take a single grain of wheat or hen's egg for granted. Papa! Papa, don't keep Mr. Crane too long. Of course. <laughs> of course, dear. He's on his way. 
You'd better get a move on. My daughter is not to be trifled with, and I've kept you from your singing lesson too long. Of course, we hear Van Tassel. Thank you for the tour. Coming, Katrina! You're lucky I said something. My father would have shown you every corner of the farm before he'd let you go. Ah, it would not be such a bad thing, but I appreciate your timely arrival nonetheless. May we begin? Yes, please come inside. Oh, my. Something the matter? Oh, no, nothing's the matter. I am simply awed by spaciousness of your home. It is a very big house, to be sure. Here, let me show you around. Our parlor should be the best room to practice singing in. Would that suit you, Mr. Crane? It should do nicely. And please, my good lady, call me Ichabod. From the moment Ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight, the peace of his mind was at an end, and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. In this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight-errant of yore, who seldom had anything but giants, enchanters, fiery dragons, and such like easily conquered adversaries. La 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 la. Very good. Now the next. La 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 la. Ah, lovely. I'll say. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Goodness! Who the devil are you? Oh, I can ask you the same question. Brom, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, what? Can I no longer drop by unannounced? I just happened to be riding by and thought I would stop in to say hello to you. Your father gave me his blessing at the gate, so I tied up Daredevil and came in. I didn't expect you to have company. Then perhaps you did not stop to ask my father anything. I am in fact in the midst of a singing lesson. Yes, and there is still a few more things to cover, so if you don't mind... Oh yes, don't mind me. You can finish up your lesson and then be on your way, Mr. Uh... Crane. Ichabod Crane. Hmm. The schoolmaster. Fitting name, I suppose. Hmm. Ichabod, this is Brom Van Brunt. Brom Bones, to be precise. You've no doubt heard of me. Indeed. I have heard tell of some of your... gallantries about the hollow. I take it you're a friend of Katrina. Friend? Oh. A little more than that, I dare say. At least I hope so. Uh, and a little more of a nuisance every moment. You get out of here this instant, Brombones. Edmus hearing your beautiful singing voice? Oh, but Katrina... I do believe, sir, that lady has made her wishes known. Stay out of this, Bookie. Crane. Whatever. Out! And don't come back unless I send for you. Fine. I'll leave you be, cat. But when you're done ruffling this crane's feathers, you can come find me. I won't be far off. Hmph. How uncouth. My apologies, Ichabod. Brahm is as wild and tactless as that unbroken horse of his. But he's more bark than bite. Don't take what he says too seriously. Quite all right, Katrina. No need to apologize for someone else barging in unannounced. We'll just pick up where we left off, shall we? Hey, Crane. Oh, Mr. Van Brunt. I was just leaving. Look here. I see what you're up to. I have no idea what you're insinuating, sir. Don't play dumb with me, you weasel. I've got my sights set on Katrina. And I'm not about to let some spindly little gutter snipe like you get in my way. If that is a concern of yours, Mr. Bones, you have nothing to fear from me. I am but a humble singing teacher, hoping to guide a gifted voice to even loftier realms of sublimity. My intentions are nothing but pure. Good. And you best make sure they stay that way. Or you and me? We're going to have some real problems. Are we clear on that? N never clearer. Splendid. Glad we had this talk, Ichabod. Now, if you'll excuse me... I have a lady to woo. <laughs> what a troublesome fellow. But he underestimates me, and that shall be his downfall. I may bend, but I will not break. Not while the affections of the fair Katrina are at stake. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend. 
To have taken the field openly against Brom would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his armors. Ichabod therefore made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse. Not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers. Baltus von Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better even than his pipe and, like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm or sauntering along in the twilight, that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. Great. As if the eye of all the damsels in town wasn't enough, now he's got Miss Katrina all to himself. <laughs> like you would stand a chance with her. I stand as good a chance as anyone. Speak for yourself. It's just a fact, Frederick. Long and short of it is, that Crane fella has some knack that we just don't. And if not Crane, then we have to deal with Brom Bones. <laughs> I'm not afraid of Brom. He doesn't own Katrina's heart, and neither does the schoolmaster. That ain't fitting all right, I still say. I have half a mind to- Afternoon, boys. Hey, Brom. Oh, uh, hello, Brom. Uh, we weren't, uh, we, we, we were just, uh... Oh, no need to be jumpy. I'm just here to observe like you. <laughs> Look at that prancing pedagogue. He's not fooling anyone. If I ever get my hands on him, I'll double that schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf in his own schoolhouse. Huh. That'll show him. The whole neighborhood adores him. Not to mention Miss Katrina and her father. Aye, and that's the worst part of it, my lads. He knows he can't beat me in a fair fight. It sneaks and skulks around like a snake in the grass. You look like you want to propose something, Brom. What's on your mind? Boys, I know we've had our differences in the past. But I come to you now in a spirit of civility. For once, we have a common enemy. I can get behind that way of thinking. So can I! But what do we do? Just follow my lead, lads. <laughs> I've got plans for old Ichabod Crane. Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system. It left Brom no alternative but to draw upon the front of rustic waggery in his disposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney. And there. That should do the trick. Right then, watch this. <laughs> This is gonna be good. <laughs> good heavens! <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> oh, you, you fiends! Get down from there this instant! Don't mind us, Ichabod. We're just up here enjoying the view. <laughs> ah, ah. Broke into the schoolhouse at night and turned everything topsy-turvy. Oh, goodness. So that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meanings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule and in presence of his mistress. <laughs> How intriguing. So we are upside down even as we speak? So we are, though that is relative to the position of the earth. I know many still doubt it, but the world does indeed turn round, and we are all but kept on its face by the sheer speed of its rotation. Tell me, does all of your reading relate to science, psalmody, or that dreadful Cotton Mather book? Surprising as it may seem, my dear, I do have a varied measure of reading. I am quite fond of the work of William Shakespeare. In fact... I could very well recite one for you, if you would care to hear. Of course, I would love to. <laughs> yes, well... <clears throat> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> what in the... <laughs> Why, Ichabod! So shocked to see your old singing instructor? Here, Katrina, this fellow dog taught Ichabod everything he knows. 
The resemblance is uncanny, isn't it? Look at that snout. Separated at birth, am I right? Abraham Van Brunt. Now, Katrina, we could just ignore him. A word, Brom. Now. Ooh. <laughs> Gladly. <laughs> Finally seeing the light, eh? <laughs> you are a scoundrel and a cad, Brom Bones. Your antics aren't amusing anyone. Well, I beg to differ. I'm having a great time of it. Do you have nothing better to do with your time than follow us around and act like a buffoon? Not until you realize how much of a mistake you're making. I'm making a mistake? You've got some nerve. Give it up, Katrina. You know that skinny schoolmaster is just a tease. He has nothing to offer. Unlike me and my 13 pectorals. He has class and intelligence, both aspects that you are exceedingly lacking. Ah, all fancy talk and no more. Come now, you know in your heart where your real affections lie. What's in my heart does not concern you. If you're trying to prove something by making fun of Ichabod, then you're less of a man than even I thought. But Katrina... Not another word. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. The things I've heard you've done to poor Ichabod? Come talk to me again when you're ready to stop behaving like a child. Let's go, Ichabod. Um, of course, Katrina. <laughs> well done, Ichabod. You let that woman defend you. Well, uh, I guess it could have gone better. Shut up. On a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned on the lofty stool from whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. Apparently, there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books or slyly whispering behind them with one eye kept upon their master, and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the classroom. Hmm? I say, the visitor. Who could that be? Master Crane? Yes, that would be me. Beg pardon for the intrusion, but I've come bearing an invitation. You're cordially invited to Van Tassel Farm for a quilting frolic tonight. A party? Oh, yes! <clears throat> yes. Please, my good man, tell Minheer Van Tassel that I most graciously accept his invitation and shall be there tonight. Will do, sir. Afternoon. Good afternoon! Thank you! <laughs> yes, yes, a party at Van Tassel's. Children, put away your books. Class is dismissed. Go on now. Shoo, shoo. <laughs> At last, a chance to really show my abilities to Katrina. This party is just the excuse I need. Oh, but, oh, but there's so much to do. I'll have to brush my one good suit, fix my hair. Oh, gracious, I must make the best impression possible. I can very well make the journey on foot. I... I must be bold. Approach like a cavalier. Well, I don't know, Ichabod. Please, Van Ripper. You are my oldest and dearest friend in this part of the country. I have no one else to turn to. I'm just asking for a horse for the evening, that's all. I promise you that your steed will be returned as swiftly as possible once the party ends. Well, suppose I could spare old gunpowder. He's gotten on in years a bit, but he should do fair. My thanks. Trust me, I will be forever in your debt for this favor. Used to be quite a fine steed back in the day. One of my favorites, in fact. I should warn you, he's got a bit of a mean streak. Oh, now, now. It's nothing I can't handle. I'm sure... <laughs> Oh. The animal was a broken-down plow horse that had outlived almost everything but its viciousness. He was gaunt and shagged with a ewe neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral, but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Now you take good care of gunpowder and this saddle here. This is my good Sunday saddle, mind. It's the least I can do to dress this old creature up again. Once again, I appreciate your kindness, and so I shall take my leave. Here, gunpowder. Giddy up. <laughs> Give him a couple good kicks. That'll get him going. <laughs> yes, thank you. 
Giddy up! Whoa! Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a scepter, and as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on the tip of his nose, for his scanty strip of forehead might be called, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed as they shambled out of the gate of Hans Van Ripper, and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day. The sky was clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery with which we always associate the idea of abundance. The forest had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frost into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air. The bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory knots and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. Oh, the dames of France were fine and free, the famished lips are willing. Very soft, the maids of Italy, and Spanish eyes are thrilling. Still, though I bask beneath their smiles, their charms will fail to bind me. And my heart falls back to Aaron's Isle, to the girl I left behind me. Hello there! <laughs> oh, now, now see here! Oh. <laughs> Didn't mean to startle you, Ichabod. I was just on my way to Van Tassel's and thought I heard the screeching of a crane. Oh, fancy meeting you on the road. Hmm. Well, as it so happens, I too am en route to Minheer Van Tassel's farm. Huh. I guess I'll invite anyone these days. Hmm. By the way, what manner of beast are you riding? This? Oh, well, this... This is gunpowder. Well, I see. A very interesting choice of mount. Looks to be pretty well broken. It does not appear the same can be said for your own steed, seeing how it tramps about so. Daredevil here is a creature of spirit. It keeps me alert. Where is the adventure in riding a horse that is entirely predictable? Hmm. I should say it suits you very well. Thank you. Don't suppose you fancy a race, Skullmaster? Certainly not. Fair enough. I doubt that sad animal of yours could even gallop. I'll just take my leave then. Get a good head start. Katrina's expecting me, after all. Let's go, Daredevil. Yeah! <coughs> oh, that brute. To think he'll get there first, but... <laughs> uh, what have I to fear? Don't worry, gunpowder, old fellow. Slow and steady wins the race. Or so Aesop has taught us. Yes. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of the Heer Van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Fain would I pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of Van Tassel's mansion. Such heaped up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds known only to be experienced Dutch housewives. And then there were apple pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies besides slices of ham and smoked beef and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches and pears and quinces, not to mention broiled shad and roasting chickens together with bowls of milk and cream. Mm, where do I begin? I'll just take a little of this. Ooh, and some of that. Mm, and this ham does look so divine. Ichabod was a kind and thankful creature whose heart dilated in proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer and whose spirits rose with eating as some men's do with drink. He could not help too rolling his large eyes round him as he ate and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all of this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor. Then he thought how soon he'd turn his back upon the old schoolhouse, snap his fingers in the face of Hans Van Ripper and every other niggardly patron, and kick any itinerant pedagogue out of doors that should dare to call him comrade. Oh, I'm not surprised to find you here, Ichabod. Ah, my good Van Tassel, your hospitality is not lost on me, and I am grateful for this incredible fare you've prepared. Oh, well, fall to and help yourself. My daughter has been asking after you, and I would not be one to keep her seeking. Ichabod! There you are, Ichabod. 
I was wondering when you would arrive. I have only been here for a matter of minutes, and I must say the state of this party is much improved by your lovely presence. <laughs> You're too kind, sir. I mean every word I say, Katrina. Ah, that's the dancing started. We'd better get a move on. Shall we? Indeed. Ah, it's a sight to see this room so full of laughter and merrymaking. That's right. You've only been here for my lessons. I'm glad to say our house is large enough to host such festivities. Katrina, if I may be so bold, I was wondering if you would do me the honor... Katrina! Brom Bones, what do you want now? Well, I want you to dance with me, naturally. Is that any way to ask a lady to dance? Why, I ought to... Don't you dare. Picking up where I left off before I was so rudely interrupted. Would you do me the honor of joining me for a dance, good lady? Sir, the honor would be mine. I shall join you happily. Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fiber about him was idle, and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room, you would have thought St. Vitus himself, that blessed patron of the dance, was figuring before you in person. The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and smiling <laughs> graciously in reply to all his amorous <laughs> oddlings, while Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in one corner. Mm, no good, dirty, rotten son of a When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who, with old Van Tassel, sat smoking at one end of the piazza, gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war. I tell you, that frigate was crippled and listing, all wrapped in smoke and flame. It was just me and an old nine-pounder from a mud breastwork, and I had already sunk five shots into those British dogs. I would have taken the ship single-handedly, too, had the gun not burst on the sixth discharge. Damn near set my hair on fire. And that's some story, Dilf Martling. But you know, I was at the Battle of White Plains, and my shot and powder had been long lost in the course of the day. With only my small sword, I was able to parry a musket ball, insomuch I felt it whiz round the blade and glance off the hilt. My word! What a stroke of luck! Luck is definitely what I would call it, too. I have proof of it. Here. This is the very blade. Notice the dent in the hilt. Remarkable. Hmm, White Plains. Wasn't that the same battle where the Hessian lost his head? No one knows exactly which battle that was, Baltus, though it could have well been White Plains. I recall when they buried the trooper's headless body in the churchyard. Wait, you don't mean the... The headless horseman, do you? Oh, none other! Here, Ichabod, sit with us a spell. I understand you know a thing or two about ghosts and spirits. As much as anyone might, though my true knowledge of the supernatural is centered in accounts of witchcraft and vile enchantments. But all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. There was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region. It breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies infecting all the land. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were present at Van Tassel's and, as usual, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken, and which stood in the neighborhood still. Some mention was made also of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen at Raven Rock and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm having perished there in the snow. The chief part of the stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the headless horseman who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country, and it was said tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. That churchyard has always been a queer place for phantoms in the night, especially the old wooden bridge that spans the creek nearby. I... I once encountered the horseman myself on the road to that bridge. Not so long ago. You told me you don't believe in ghosts, Bower. I didn't. At least, not until that night. 
I was on my way back into the hollow, and suddenly I hear a horse galloping on the road behind me. I looked back, and there he was. Never in my life did I think I'd see a ghost, let alone the headless horseman, and I was terror-struck. Luckily, the horses weren't frozen. They were right spooked and took off at a gallop, pulling my cart along at a mad speed. It was all I could do to keep from crashing. The horseman gained on us and eventually rode at my side, keeping pace with us as we bounced over hill and swamp. But when we reached the bridge, oh, that was when the worst of it happened. At that moment, we were about to cross. The horseman turned into a skeleton. I was so startled I tumbled from my perch and landed in the brook. And when I sat up, I saw the horseman leap away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. I was able to get my horse and cart back in one piece, but my peace of mind hasn't quite been the same since. Well, I certainly believe in ghosts now. And I'll never go anywhere near that bridge again, not even during the day. Well, I certainly don't blame you, my good Bower. I would hate to meet the, the, the headless horseman. Huh. There's nothing to fear from the old Hessian if you know how to handle him. Well, well, Brombones, what makes you speak so lightly of the horseman? Because I, too, have met the goblin in my time, and he's not but an errant jockey. Well, this we must hear, Brom. Do tell. <laughs> As it so happens, I encountered him some weeks ago while on my way back from Sing Sing. It was about midnight, but the moon revealed that the rider on the black horse was indeed headless. I'm sure many would have gawked in terror, but not I. <laughs> so, here was a chance to test Daredevil's speed against the most well-renowned horseman in the area. So, I cantered close and engaged the ghost challenging him to a race for a bowl of punch. He did not reply. How could you if you have no head to do so, am I right? But fell in with me as I spurred Daredevil into a gallop. He kept stride, but Daredevil was able to outpace the phantom horse all through the hollow. I'm sure this nettled old headless to no end. For halfway through the race, he drew a saber from under his cloak and swung it around as if trying to cleave my own head from my shoulders. But I was well ahead. Soon enough, you reached our finish line, the bridge that spans the brook. I would have won that ball of punch had the horseman kept his end, but the moment he crossed the bridge behind me, both ghost and horse disappeared in a flash of fire. That is quite a story. <laughs> yes, quite. It's all true, I swear it. I am proud to say old Daredevil proved as swift and cunning as I'd expected. Had I been any slower, I'm sure the horseman would have gained on me. And I think that saber of his was not just for show. He must be very impatient now, his head being gone so long. I think he'll just take any old head that suits him now. The revel now gradually broke up. The old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills. Some of the damsels mounted on ponies behind their favorite swains and their light-hearted laughter mingling with the clatter of hoofs echoed along the silent woodland sounding fainter and fainter until gradually they died away, and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted. Ichabod only lingered behind according to the custom of country lovers to have a tete-a-tete -tete with the heiress, fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success. Oh, Ichabod, I'm surprised you're still here. I could not very well leave without bidding you goodbye, my fair Katrina. I was just thanking your father for a most joyous evening's revelry. Well, I am also glad to know you enjoyed yourself. Your dancing was very impressive. Thank you. Though I did have an excellent partner, to be sure. <laughs> Actually, before I depart, I was wondering if I might speak with you on a personal matter. What passed at this interview I will not pretend to say, for in fact, I do not know. Something, however, must have gone wrong, for Ichabod certainly sallied forth after no very great interval with an air quite desolate and chapfallen. Of all of the... No, to think that... 
I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. After everything I've done. Could that girl have been playing off any of her coquettish tricks? Was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival? Heaven only knows, not I. Let it suffice to say, Ichabod stole forth with the air of one who had been sacking a hen roost rather than a fair lady's heart. Wake up, gunpowder, you lazy animal. Get up this instant! <laughs> now I'll have no lollygagging this time. We shall be away post-haste. And good riddance. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod, heavy-hearted and crestfallen, pursued his travel homewards. In the dead hush of midnight, he could hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the Hudson, but it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea of his distance from this faithful companion of man. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard now came crowning upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. Huh. This road does certainly feel different during the night. <laughs> <clears throat> Relax, Gunpowder. There's nothing to fear in the dark. We are going a good pace and should reach your master's gate before it grows much later. I... Oh, dear. In the center of the road stood an enormous tulip tree which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighborhood and formed a kind of landmark. Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic, large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees, twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air. It was connected with the tragic story of the unfortunate Andre, who had been taken prisoner hard by, and was universally known by the name of Major Andre's Tree. The common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition, partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake, and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it. As Ichabod approached this fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches. As he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree. He paused and ceased whistling, but on looking more narrowly, perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare. Suddenly, he heard a groan. His teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle. It was about the rubbing of one huge bow upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze. Ichabod Crane, you're letting your fancy fly away with you. Stop being so ridiculous. About 200 yards from the tree, a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen known by the name of Wiley Swamp. A few rough logs laid side by side served for a bridge over the stream. To pass this bridge was the severest trial. It was at this identical spot that the unfortunate Andre was captured. This has ever since been considered a haunted stream and fearful of the feelings of the schoolboy who has to pass it alone after dark. I do not like the look of this place. Right then, Gunpowder, there's no need to linger. We'll make a little dash across and be on our way. Giddy up! <laughs> do as I command, you obstinate beast! Go! Yeah! No, no, wretched animal! You run us right against the rail! Go across the bridge! Yeah! Gunpowder, you are the most ludicrous creature living. Get going this instant! You have no reason to stop here while I am try Try it. Just at this moment, a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. Oh, oh my. 
Um, hello? Who, who are you? I, I say, who are you? Gunpowder, for the love of God, please move. The hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late. And besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin if such it was which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Just then, the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made no offer of molestation or sociability, but kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old gunpowder. Uh, I say, friend, um, uh, five evening for a ride, eh? Igabod, who had no relish for the strange midnight companion and bethought himself of the adventure of Brom Bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steeds in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless. <laughs> But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. Away then they dashed through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long length body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow, but Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon, instead of keeping up it made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the left. No! The other way! The other way! <laughs> This road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile where it crosses the bridge famous in Goblin Story, and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church. As yet the panic of the steed had given his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase, but just as he had gone halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain, and had just time to save himself by clapping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth. Oh, Van Ripper is going to kill me, if the goblin doesn't first. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. The wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken. There it is! Come on, Gunpowder! If we can reach the bridge, the ghost will vanish and we'll be safe! Just then, he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt its hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs and old Gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod Castle looked behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. He saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. <laughs> it encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, the Black Steed, and the Goblin Rider passed by like a whirlwind. The next morning, the old horse was found without his saddle and with the bridle under his feet, soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came, but no Ichabod. The boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the bank of the brook, but no schoolmaster. Hans von Ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor Ichabod and his saddle. An inquiry was set on foot and after diligent investigation they came upon his traces. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in dirt. 
The tracks of horses' hoofs deeply dented in the road and evidently at furious speed were traced to the bridge beyond which, on the bank of a broad part of the brook, where the water ran deep and black, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close beside it, a shattered pumpkin. The brook was searched, but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered. The mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following Sunday. Knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard, at the bridge, and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found. The stories of Brower, of Bones, and a whole budget of others were called to mind, and when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping Hessian. As he was a bachelor, and in nobody's dead, nobody troubled his head any more about him. The school was removed to a different quarter of the hollow, and another pedagogue reigned in his stead. It is true, an old farmer who had been down to New York on a visit several years after brought home the intelligence that Ichabod Crane was still alive, that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and Hans Van Ripper, and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress, that he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country, turned politician, and finally had been made a justice of the ten-pound court. Brom Bones, too, who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. <laughs> What's so funny, Brom? Uh, it's like I said the night of the party, my dear. Any head will do for the horseman, even if it's just a pumpkin. <laughs> the old country wise, however, who are the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichapod was spirited away by supernatural means. And it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the winter evening fire. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond. The schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghosts of the unfortunate pedagogue. And the plowboy, loitering homeward of a still summer evening, has often fancied his voice at a distance, chanting a melancholy psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. So the story comes to a close, and unfortunately our carnival will be following suit once the last night of October passes. We are tied to the season much like an autumn leaf before it is swept away by the cold wind. But the show will continue on. It has been a true delight to be your ringmaster, intrepid listeners, and there is little doubt that the carnival will roll through again in the future. So, until next October, pleasant dreams. <laughs> Midnight Marinera is a monthly podcast written, produced, directed, and mixed by David King. This episode features the voice talents of Nick Nocturne, Nick Barbera, Dino Andrade, Nick Jewell, David King, Marissa Marinello, Heather Kipp, Michael Malconian, and Matt Hawley. The voice of the ringmaster is Xander Mobus. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is adapted from the story by Washington Irving. Comments? Suggestions? Just looking to get ahead this Halloween? Please feel free to leave feedback wherever you listen to this. Email us at midnightmarinera at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter or Tumblr. And hey... 
If you want to contribute a little something to the show and really wake the dead for a proper party, consider becoming a patron and supporting Midnight Marinera's Patreon page with a small monthly donation. Thanks for listening to us for the last two years, and happy Halloween. Did you miss me, intrepid listeners? (laughs) Ha, 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 